that was a moment where like from everything that I've done ever since, I've never been more proud of myself than in that moment. And that actually catalyzed, I think, everything else in my life to be like, wow, I just did this thing that seemed so impossible, you know, prior to me doing it. And it's like, I can do anything that I want. Morning. You made it. What's going on, What's going on? I made it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How's it going, man? Good. I'm good. I'm good. I, I can't see you though. Oh, one second. Yeah, sorry. No worries. No worries. Coffee's still, coffee's still coming in this morning. <laughs> good. It's uh, four o'clock here, uh, p.m. So uh, afternoon, late afternoon. How's how's the future? Uh, how is that? How how's the future of today? <laughs> I mean, I mean, we could do some inside trading, you know, I can tell you like what's going on with the stock market here <laughs> six hours in advance or uh, that, would, that would be great. Let's do I that. Know, I know, I know, I know, I know. All right. 17 minutes in always uh, the, the Zoom <laughs> technical stuff that you got to figure out. <laughs> For real. That's this is mainly my bad. Uh, don't worry about it, man. Don't worry about it. All right. Um, yeah, so here's what I had in mind. Like, um, I wanted to have a conversation with you um, just really quickly to, to figure out like uh, what you do and stuff like that. And then since we're already here, uh, maybe we can have like a, a half an hour to an hour conversation and uh, just use that and I'll upload it uh, to the podcast. Uh, but initially I was just, um, so this is probably not going to be uploaded, um, the initial part, unless you want to, um, doesn't really matter. But I was curious, like, um, if there's some way that if, the, if there's some way that we can work together or um, because I know that that uh, you help founders and um, you're basically an investor in some sense right and I got students and some of them uh, might be looking into uh, raising capital at some point so I was yeah. just curious about all of that stuff so if you can maybe like uh, give me a little bit of your background yeah I mean well so I, I'm really you know being on the investor side of the table is pretty new to me so like for the last decade I've I've been uh, building the, the first company that I started, uh, which is Bellhop. And uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, um, I stepped out of the day to day. We had, you know, the company had become just a large business and my skill set in the business, you know, admittedly is, is not running a big corporation. It's, it's, uh, you know, my heart's really in the early days. And so I'm, I'm yeah. one of those classic examples about, um, you know, companies just got to a point where my my skill set and my interest really just uh, was diverged. It, well, it, it was just you know I I don't think a lot of founders are like vulnerable about this, but it, it kind of blows my mind. Basically, I've never had an issue with ego in a company. Uh, like I I think you know if you, if you're really to take a look at at the, the vast majority of companies, um, I mean, people are just purpose built for certain, you know, segments of, of businesses. And, yeah. you know, I'm being one of the largest shareholders in the company, you know, I, I don't care if, if that person is me or somebody else. I just want to make sure that, you know, we have the best people running the company. And so about three years ago, my, my co-founder and I, three or four years ago, my co-founder and I had... Um, kind of a, 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 a you know, a, a parting of ways. And, and we, as a, a board, needed to make a decision on, uh, you know, who would take the baton. And, and I was basically like, look, I'm, I need private. to be, I, I need private, to be. Private company. Uh, yeah, it was a private company. Uh, and and uh, uh, how, how come, how come you guys had a board? Like um, there was something that, that you, you, uh, you wanted in order to, uh, run the business well, better or we, some extra we, accountability? We had taken, a, you know, a lot of venture. So we've raised, I think, mm. uh, a little under, uh, like right under 90 million. Oh, and, uh, and so I we're, thought it was you know, bootstrapped. No, 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 no. We, 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 we've, we raised our first round of capital in 2012 and, um, and have been, you know, on that path since. And so when you go down that path, I mean, you know, investors. Yeah, you need to explode. Yeah. What, what, give, give me like, um, uh, what was Bellhop then? So the, we are, uh, we recognized in the States, really everywhere, I'm sure, the, the act of moving relocation, actually like moving homes 
is this, it, there's this terrible black cloud that, that kind of flies over the entire industry. And there's really no differentiation between competitors. I mean, there's no one brand name that's known for just being outstanding. You know, it's, yeah. it's a yeah, really yeah, yeah. difficult, you know, human experience driven thing, but there's some, you know, some major headwinds in the space that makes it just tough. So moving is a highly seasonal business and uh, it really unsexy, but it's, but the customer experience is entirely driven by the workforce. And so the main reason that, that, moving companies get such a bad rap is it's not like they're bad people. It's just, it's just a really hard business. And mm -hmm. there had not been any tech that had uh, been built to kind of redefine the model. And so everybody's kind of just running this franchise based uh, model. And in, in if you're, if you're scaling a moving company to where, you know, you, if you have 10 trucks, you try to grow as much as you can one year, let's say you grow 10% and the next year you buy an 11th truck and you basically you drive your growth based on like the number of assets you're able to keep utilized. Yeah. And, yeah. and, but that's a, there's a big, there's a huge level of cost associated with that. You have to give away a lot of the proceeds of the business to these franchise owners. And like, that's really the only way that traditional moving companies figure out how to scale. So we actually came in and had this idea of um, what if we build a workforce management platform kind of on a, a you know, on a mobile driven gig uh, type of, of, um, uh, of workforce. Yeah. Uh, and then combined that with a, a, a network of third party trucking companies that just handle the transportation piece. So our workforce is just doing the moving. And then we are contracting with prof professional carriers to show up with a truck, meet our moving crews at the home. Our moving crews are doing all the moving, loading the packing, et cetera. Uh, the truck driver is just literally just sitting in the, in the cab of the truck taking a nap. And when it's time to move, go to the next address, they drive, open the back of the truck, our bellhops follow, unload it, et cetera. And at the end of the move, that driver just goes on to their next job. And so what that has done for us okay. is... So, so, so um, the part of, of, of getting the, the stuff out of people's homes into the truck, that's you guys. And then the, the truck driver itself, that's uh, a gig worker. Uh, well, no. So our, 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 our bellhops are all gig workers. It, it's like, it, it's like Luke Skywalker, like everything you said in that sentence was wrong. <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, so we, we handle everything from, from booking to completion. We don't outsource anything. It's just okay. the, the carriers that we partner with. Those are not our assets. They are contracted carriers, just like our workforce is contracted uh, independent contractors. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're all operating on the same, you know, bellhop app where, you know, when a customer goes on, books a move online, that just feels just like booking any other moving company, except you can do it all online. Um, but in our back end, our matching algorithms are assigning that move to a to one of our partner carriers and then yeah. matching with a, a bellhop crew. And those two parties actually meet on location. So basically what it's done is it's taken what's traditionally been a fixed cost, you know, assets being a fixed cost for a moving company. And now it's, yeah. we've, it's a variable. Yeah. And that yeah. is really helpful because moving being the super seasonal thing um, is, uh, it, you know, if, if you have these assets, you're like trying to make hay while the sun's shining, you know, in peak season. Yeah. And then so you off. can, uh, it's, it's like a bear, you know, the, then you go into nutrition and then you can survive. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So in the off season, these trucks are just sitting in a parking lot, but with us, we don't have that issue. So we've got some P and L advantages on just our, the model, but it also allows us to grow way faster because like if we're launching a city, we turn on our, our, uh, you know, supply levers for, um, for, for our trucking partners and for our, our workforce. And like within six weeks, we have like 10 times the capacity of the largest traditional moving company, you know, in the city. And, yeah. and, and without having to, to spend any, you know, capital uh, to, to buy those assets and get parking and physical location and any of that stuff. So that's anyway, that's long explanation how Bellhops is, is doing what it's doing, but it's fast growing moving company in the U.S. Um, and uh, it's, it's an amazing business, it's, but it's, it's a hard business as well. Wow, that's crazy, man! How how old were you guys when you started? Uh, we twenty five, uh, wow. or yeah. right under, yeah, twenty four, twenty five. Yep. 
kind of kind of like solving your own uh, scratching your own itch or um... well we you know we i grew up in the south in the south when i graduated college i didn't know what venture capital was and you know it, it's unlike you know the south is now this like booming region in the u.s from a tech standpoint because we're having so many people relocating from other areas um but like growing up you know being an entrepreneur where i come from is like you know starting a restaurant or like being yeah. a doctor or like you know yeah, yeah 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 having your own small business and scaling companies was not something i would say you know most people my age really thought of it when they were growing up but that's all changing now so um yeah so anyway we started when we were 24 25 we realized it was right at the advent of like mobile workforce management platforms like uber had just you know been created we're like oh wow we can coordinate a large number of of uh of of you know labor with with what with demand on our platform just through an iphone that had never been able to be done before and uh, so we were kind of on that front edge of how do we kind of use technology to build a, a business that's just more scalable than the income in, than the incumbents Fascinating. Was it something that you guys um, had in mind when you started out or uh, did you start out very small and then gradually you ease, ease your way into that? Yeah, no. I mean, we totally, our story is one of just constantly marching up market where. Okay. Yeah. Too. That's what, yeah. That's what I always preach. Yeah. Because it's it, the story that um, you want to have all your ducks in a row is the story that like everyone preaches. And I, and on, and on paper you can do it but I've, I've i've almost like never seen it in practice and and if i see it in practice i hear people uh, tell a story about a certain company maybe the founder or maybe someone else what what have you and then you look into the details and you're like nope that's not a, that's yeah. not what that's not what happened it's so you know people think that founders that you know the founders are these these visionaries that can see like 10 years in the future and that's just yeah. like maybe that's true once in a generation like yeah. Elon Musk might be a good example with his secret master plan that he wrote in like yeah. the early 2000s. And he's basically followed that plan to a T. But that is so rare. I mean, the vast yeah. majority of things but are even, just- but even, but even Elon, like, like the, the very initial starting of, 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 of um, uh, Tesla, for example, it wasn't him. It was Martin and, and all, of, all those guys. So, you know, you, there, there's already a, a, a working seed, essentially, you know, and then you can take it even further back with uh, AC propulsions who, you know, so there's, there's, yeah. You're, you're yeah. totally right. It's just, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, the, that, I mean, the 99, I'd say not, over 99% of these things, it's like founders have the, the, you know, the gall to, kind of go against the the numbers and say look i'm going to do this thing not knowing yeah, exactly yeah. where this thing's going to end up and there's so much luck you know that plays into it like you know you start out with this like most founders start out with this bite-sized idea and it just gives them enough conviction to where they can leave whatever whatever else they're doing and then but that one step allowed them to just step into the future and say okay what what other things could we do and if you make enough of the right decisions along that path um you know, uh, assuming that the, the market kind of opens it up itself yeah. up, to you, you're able to, you know, to build a big company that way. It's just, it's just and larger. The, the way I say it, it, it's almost like, like, imagine if you and I right now, we decided we wanted to climb Mount Everest together. All right. We don't know anything about climbing. Right. But like the first step is like, we're going to do it. The first step is buying a plane ticket. And we, you know, we fly over there. Yeah. And we get to, you know, we work at a coffee shop and start meeting climbers and talking to Sherpas and whatever. And then like somebody offers us to, to, you know, like climb up to like base camp with them. We learn a little bit of this, you know, you know, how to do this or that along the way. And somebody gives us some gear and like, you've got that, like, you see the summit, but you have no idea how to get, how to there. get there. What skills yeah. are going to be developed, what path you're going to take. And, but you can't, ever actually think about doing that if you don't just make that first step and i think that's what most founders do is they just take that first step towards look i i think there's something here i want to take the risk and then the rest of you know it's all opened up to you after you take that first path or, or yeah first path. yeah i i yeah it's literally like impossible for me to agree more because that's the whole ideology i have when it comes to uh doing entrepreneurship um my way for 
lack of a better way of putting it. Um, but yeah, I fully agree. There's um, there are, there are, there are two things uh, which are interesting uh, to me. First one is um, in behavior science, there's something which is called a success momentum, which is essentially um, if you have a subject, subject, a person, whatever, um, you yourself or someone else, and there are essentially two ways in which you can make behavior easier. You can make behavior easier by increasing the motivation of the subject through a variety of ways, or you can simply make the behavior itself easier. Um, however, if you um, make a behavior easy enough such that when a subject is prompted, they will execute a given behavior. Um, there are some nuance here, but I don't wanna go into too much detail, but um, they can feel good about themselves once they have done that. Like I said, there are some nuance, but like just for simplicity's yep. sake. Uh, and then what happens is uh, their motivation and their self-efficacy, their belief in them, in their own skills, essentially increases, um, which has the result that um, for that they can now tackle a harder motivation, uh, a harder behavior, I mean, uh, without needing um, a, a such a big increase in motivation or in ability. So there's this, this hence, hence success momentum. You, you get this momentum of uh, success. And um, you see it, you see, everybody knows this intuitively. Like no one goes to the gym and it's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to deadlift 500 pounds. Never done it before, but you just got to believe. You got you to gotta want it. You got to think big. You know, that's what my VZs told me. Think big, you know? How are you going to become the next Google? Let's go. <laughs> I'm going to become the Ronnie Coleman. No, you start small. And then, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not too easy. It's not too hard to do it. You feel good about yourself. You do a little bit more. Now, you, now you're starting to, to dream a little bit bigger. And you're like, ooh, you know, if I keep going, maybe I can hit like, uh, you know, 400 pounds. And then, you know, 410. And ooh, you know, if, it, if I keep doing it like this, before you know, it's like 450. So it's, it's this gradual process. And if you look at like Elon Musk, people always start like, same with uh, Steve Jobs and, uh, and Wasp. People start at the end as if like Tesla and SpaceX were like the first companies. Then they then they will take then they will say that okay, well it was PayPal. No, PayPal was with Max Lapchin Pigatil. Okay, so X.com. No, it was the it was the, the goddamn video game that he made. That yeah. was the first. And that's how it snowballs. Same with Steve and uh, uh, Wozniak and, uh, and Steve Jobs. And, and, and then people forget like, you know, the, the, the Apple comes out and then there's like a 15 year period or 13 per, uh, year long period of like nothing before they hit like success again. And, and everyone, you know, in their minds and the media does a good job of like pushing this narrative as well. It's like they started with iPhone almost, you know, they had, they had a very successful uh, Mac and then iPhone and then, you know, all of the stuff that you see right now. <laughs> So it's like right. there, there was the narrative is, is the complete opposite. And, it, and it's not just, you know, it, it's, it's one way to think about that process, like in one vertical, like, like weightlifting, like you start small yeah. and then you lift more. But it actually, I think the way it works is like, let's say you, you can, you started out being able to deadlift like a hundred pounds. And then like, you know, your, your goal was to get to 500, but now you're doing 250, right? Yeah. That you've got momentum and, and confidence and self-esteem that you didn't have before that translates to other parts of your life, right? Yeah. That, where it's yeah. like, okay, I did that in weightlifting. Well, I can do this in my job. And like, for example, I'm a pilot and uh, oh, nice. one of the most impactful moments of my life was, wasn't when I got my pilot's license, it was when I soloed my first plane. And that nice. happened about 15 hours into training. And that was a moment where like from everything that I've done ever since, I've never been more proud of myself than in that moment. And that actually catalyzed, I think, everything else in my life to be like, wow, I just did this thing that seemed so impossible, you know, prior to me doing it. And it's like, I can do anything that I want, right? It's yeah. just like little yeah. moments of successes as you, as you go through. And I, I think the main thing is like, yeah, like Steve and, 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 uh, um, and, uh, Wozniak. Yeah. Steve Wozniak and, and, and Steve jobs, them going into what they did. It's all like just risk. It's like risk on risk on risk ends up, you know, risk is the, the thing that I think founders have to really understand how to harness because it's like, yes, you have to be smart. You have to be hardworking. You have to have all those like prerequisite like hard skills right um but it's risk that ends up always being the determining factor on like does something actually become huge because yeah. it's like you have along the path of growing a business 
you'll you'll find these forks in a road where it's like I can take the easier path that I that is more certain, or I can take the harder path that's less certain but has potentially bigger out you know a bigger outcome. And if you continue making the right decision along the way, that's how something gets bigger. Um, interesting, interesting. Yeah. So 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 you, so you view it as um, yeah. That reminds me of um, uh, a framework that Mark Andreessen uh, shared um, in one of his Stanford lectures. Uh, I believe it, he calls it like peeling like risk layers of an onion, where it's like you have a, a, a layer of like market risk and then you peel it off and a layer of like technical risk and, and then you peel it off. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's really what it comes down to. It's like, that's the one thing you can have everything else in the toolbox, but if you don't, if you're not willing to continually take risks, and double in and double in and double in, you know, that is how a company is scaled is like, you know, eventually you get to the point where like you have such strong product market fit that it just takes off. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But getting to that, that point takes a lot of, you know, risk on risk on risk, you know, bellhop, for example, we started moving college kids and then their parents started asking us to move them. And so we started moving them and then they were like, you know, we were just doing labor only at the time. And they were like, well, look, we don't want to have to go get the U-Haul. Can you bring the truck? And so it was like yeah. continual just step change improvements that we made to our product. Yeah. It was always that, a decision of like risk. Yeah, that, that, that's a very, um, ironically, that's like a great way of like de-risking it essentially. Because, because the first thing that people, and I still don't know why this is, I think part Part of it, this is always like nature nurture, you know, how much of this is like learned behavior and how much is it is partly uh, human. And I think like, I think uh, maybe it's something like 70, 30, um, where it's like nature is 70 and like 30 is learned because there are, there are a lot of like factors you can point to the media and there are a lot of, you know, in the narratives of angels, NPCs, et cetera. Um, but like some of my smartest friends who have taught me a lot of the stuff that I know they thought they taught me all of this stuff so they should should know like how to like uh, uh, approach this in a way where you remove the risk and then like for their new product line or whatever they do the exact opposite like spend a million dollars in a new product um build build it before you test your assumptions then you launch it now you have now you have a solution in search of a problem like all of those those so there, for some reason there's a, a, a very strong human component which is like a, a very massive vector which points in the wrong direction you know and then you're it's so weird and, and, and yeah because everyone yeah you, you know all this stuff you know you know exactly like you said you know where it's like you know you de-risk it as much as possible and you guys did it accidentally and probably by 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 uh because you had you probably bootstrapped it during that period of time i assume so then you don't have a choice because like yep. there is no there is oh, yeah exactly there is no we're going to invest like 10 million dollars in order to build a platform because you don't have it um, but once you do have it, then people skip this step for some reason. But what I like most about it, I, um, I wanted to make two points uh, previously. I wanted to talk about success momentum, but something else um, which popped into my head um, was there's only so much which you can, uh, there's only so much that you can figure out ex ante before the situation. You know, um, if you have if you have um, something which um, X, something which functions as a very simplistic, simple uh, a system, like dropping this pencil, that's a very simple system. And even though there's a lot going on, this pencil is made of atoms, you know, you have air molecules, you have resistance. It just so happens that like all of that stuff doesn't really matter because it's so, the, the effects are so tiny. So you can, you can get a ridiculous approximation of, uh, of, of the behavior of this pencil when I drop it with like a tiny number of variables, but that's not the case in entrepreneurship. That, and and be, in, in such situations, what you want to do is, is exactly like you said, um, you buy a plane ticket and you go to the mountain because as you tr because you're when you're trying to figure out everything ex ante in your head, essentially what you're doing is you're running a simulation of reality in your mind. Yep. Which means you're just making stuff up because it's a complex adaptive system with a thousand variables and they function like a web and you pull this variable, but it affects like 15 others and those affect like 12 others. So I, the best I, I thing can, you can do is start small and get going. And yeah, totally. totally. The, the way I describe vision for a, for a founder, like a lot of people think vision is just like you had a dream or something and you saw the full picture. I have a dream. <laughs> and it's, it's not, vision is not that. Vision is like you as the founder 
like the number one contribution that you can make to the company in the early days is like spending time and thought, like just pure time and thought about like, what is the right future for the company? And so vision is like, you know, it's like being, you know, there's another stupid analogy, but like trying to like hack, like somewhere there's like a hidden city in the, in the jungle. Okay. And you leave your camp, which is like your team and you go out and you, you try canoeing down the river and you get a dead end, you get eaten by a croc and you, you backtrack and then you go, you take, you know, the path through the mountains and, and you go over there and sure enough, you fall off. The cliff. And it's like, you go out ahead of the company and, tr and, and think through as many possible hypotheticals as you can. And there's millions of these thoughts. Like if you could weigh these thoughts, it, it would be in like metric tons. Yeah. And, but then like you find the village, all right. After like a million like dead ends and like you finally found the path to the village i right? that it, the work isn't over there it's it, like the work is just now beginning because now you have to go back to camp and be like i know where we're going where to, yes exactly i've been there i can't tell you exactly how, how i made every decision to get there there was a million things that went through my mind you know over the last x amount of time etc just trust me we're going there and follow me, you know, and that's how you get your team behind a vision. And, uh, it, you know, teams fall into a vision where it's like when they look at their leader, they look in his eyes or her eyes and they have conviction that they know where they're going. Right. Yeah. And it's like faith in like, I will follow you. And, uh, and that's what vision is. It's just, it's just doing the work to, you know, get out ahead of, of what you're doing in just in thought, you know? Yeah. That's a fascinating point. Yeah. I think, I think vision, um, personally is like massively overrated. I, I, I think vision, you work with a different set of companies in a, in a different set of stages. So, um, that's one important distinction because in mathematics, you always need to be clear about like the domain that you're working in, um, because it changes uh, stuff. Um, the, the, um, I'm essentially the, the um, people that I that I work with usually are uh, either like marketing professionals. So people who are who have a job uh, and want to learn more about like marketing and marketing strategy, all of that stuff, especially if it's like evidence based versus like baloney, which is a massive problem in in marketing. And like it's uh, yeah, it's super annoying, um, but also like bootstrappers. And then it's like uh, it's figuring out what's the, the, the minimum burn, you know, that, that, that you're comfortable with. And then how can you surpass that with your company? And then, you know after that you know do what you want so it's a it's a different problem and in those situations like forget about vision you know it's so unnecessary uh, but even even uh when it comes to like startups i think like there's vision all it feels to me like the equivalent of like printing business cards you know i i i, I know vision can be important but it a part of me feels like it's like this this um, way of procrastinating of doing stuff that actually matters not to say that strategy isn't important um, but like you know if you if, if you don't even have product market fit you know you, you just ra raise seed or whatever you're still like figuring out like everything you're just imagining stuff you know so, so it's different is... if you if you're if you have like series a series b and you already have like this this gut feeling of where it's going to go but no I, what's I your think take on that on. yeah i mean you, you know it's impossible to have I, you know, but I I'd also liken it to kind of what you were talking about earlier. It's like, you know, in the early days of a company, there's no possible way to like see the future, right? Like yeah. You just have to start going down the path. Yeah, and like, exactly. I don't know, maybe a way to put it is I, I would might maybe disagree a little bit on, you know, vision does matter in the early days, but like vision is just, as a founder, I have gone down a bunch of different hypothetical paths in my mind. Yeah. And I think this is probably the one that we need to take right now, right? Yeah, so fair enough. Maybe yeah. the better analogy is like, instead of maybe you don't find that village, right? You know, right off the bat, you know, before you talk to your team, it's like you go out and you take one path, you get a dead end, you come back to the team and say, I hit a dead end. And then you go back into the woods and you go a little further and you come back and you report back. And like, yeah. it's like vision is like this thing that's necessary in that you have to know where you want to go as a company because if you don't you're just you know you're just throwing it up to like well let's just let's just hope you know we get lucky on this thing yeah. um 
I, and, and I think one de, de, uh, delineation I'd make around this is, you know, you, you have like 99% of your companies are like the 10 year overnight successes, like just laying yeah. bricks, right? 1% of these companies like just find lightning in a bottle, right? And like mm. the founders like, I don't even know why we're growing, but we're growing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, that's, that is like the 1% of the time or whatever it is. And, but that's what everybody outside of startups, like, and even founders in startups, they want to cling to, like, why are we not, why do we not have lightning in a bottle when really that's just, that that's just luck, right? Like I yeah, honestly yeah. respect yeah. founders that found lightning in a bottle way less than founders that grinded on a single issue or problem for like a decade before, yeah. you know, getting yeah. to Jake. And so, yeah, I, I think it's, I, yeah, we may be on a tangent here, but yeah, I, I think that it's, it's like people just need to think about when they're building their, when you go into building a company, you need to understand that, that this is like a 10 year, just, just sacrificial grind that you're about to go on and uh, where you're going to make far more failures and successes and you just have to ride those ways. And, you know, I, I think that message used to be felt really well, like 10 years ago, startup founders weren't celebrities like you you weren't a founder because you want you were chasing status or like a resume line or anything that's like totally changed like founders today are you know they're treated like celebrities when you go raise a pre-seed round you haven't built anything yet and yeah and i think a lot of you know the the motivations around you know startup founders today is uh, are kind of skewed from where they were like 10 years ago um but anyway that's a different topic yeah, it is an it is an interesting point. For me, the analogy that I always love um, is: Do you know Stephen Pressfield by any chance? No. Oh, he's a he's an author. He wrote um, the War of Art, um, and it's a book about like the creative struggle of be- him becoming an author. He was someone who uh, uh, really struggled with uh, becoming a writer, which is something that he really wanted, um, and it, it got so bad that he contemplated suicide. Uh, but eventually, like for uh, you know a, a ver- whatever reason um he managed to like you know make the shift and actually started writing and uh his, his key takeaway essentially um was that um turning pro is is what what saved him essentially and he defines turning pro as like sh- just show up and do the work essentially um and and he has this he has this way of putting it where it's like you know you're ju- you're a plumber you know you you show up you do the work and then you leave forget about the fanciness, you know, just, you know, just be a professional, do the work. And uh, yeah, I really, I really, I, I really admire like crafts uh, men or if that, I don't know if that's still PC or whatnot, crafts people, perhaps, I don't know, uh, <laughs> crafts, yeah, yeah. crafts persons, but I really admire that, that like that attitude where it's like, okay, um, because a crafts um, person is like the epitome of that. Like, you know, you show up, you do the work, you, you have a, a little bit of a tummy ache, who gives a crap, you know? stop whining have you have you 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 know my uh the uh what what i'm building right now with my partners at brickyard i mean that is entirely our i I mean our 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 url is just laybrick.com i mean it's a (laughs) nice we're we're vibing on the same frequency here (laughs) 100 percent. no i mean like we respect founders that just do the work like you said and you know those are the types that that we go after so it may be helpful to talk through, but I think, you know, what, what is taking up all my time now is we, we've started Brickyard. We believe that the future of early stage venture and early stage building is going to be uh, like camp based, uh, where you have these camps all over the, the country that are started by exited founders that aren't ready to get back in the trenches themselves, but they want to, you know, use all of the, the gifts that they've been given, you know, in, in mm-hmm. knowledge and skills at building their own companies to help others, right? Like that's just yeah. a common thread with, with founders. And each one of these camps is basically going to have a different style, you know, and a, a different kind of savvy. Um, and founders are, so to speak, going to rush these camps and fall in with the camp that they, you know, that they vibe with most. And like, just imagine these like almost like purpose built like giant hacker houses. So yeah, if you yeah, think yeah. about the early days of Y Combinator, the, the YC brand was like built 
in the early days, like those like first two, three years where it was Paul Graham and, you know, a lot of Alexis those and uh, Alexa Haney. Yeah, exactly. Sam Altman. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and, and that was like this tight knit group of people that like had the secret that they knew that they knew nobody else knew. Yeah. And, and, and YC began to snowball off of like, like, how do you, you have this organization that sets the bar super high. It's a super elite kind of group. There's like a brand and a culture to it. Everybody yeah. wanted to be a part of it. It was kind of counterculture. Um, and, and, like, now it's Louis, and now it's Louis Vuitton or Gucci. Exactly. And now it's like you've got 500 companies in a cohort and it's all virtual. And like, it's riding the coattails of like the real value, like the real special magic that YC had. And what like, it's, it's kind of, in my opinion, a victim of its own success now. Where Dude, YC I, I, is what Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not super popular because I know a, a few people uh, who went uh, through YC or, you know, were partners at some point, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not like a super big fan of YC, honestly. Uh, in part um, because of, of because of the the domain that I'm working on, which is like bootstrappers, which is a, a vastly different problem. Um, but but also because a little bit, I have a, a a little bit of an issue with the way that they communicate, um, which is that I I don't feel like they're doing a good job of communicating what they do and who it's for. Um, because the way I see it, are you familiar with the term ergodicity in economics, ergodicity or um, nope. physics? Um, if you have a system and you need to remove noise, there are essentially two ways that you can remove noise. You have a pattern and then you can copy that pattern like a million times. And then you can take the average of those million sequences. And now you have, now you have an average pattern. Uh, and you've done that by taking an uh, ensemble and then averaging it. So that's one way of removing noise. Another way is taking just one pattern, but then letting it run for a million years, you know, uh, on a computer. And now you get, now you also get an average. Um, sometimes you are lucky and you have, a, you have a, a particular system where it doesn't matter which way you analyze it and you try to remove noise, the average is the same. So if you take the ensemble average, you get something which looks like that. If you take the other average, it's called the time average, you also get a function which looks like that. Um, so then it doesn't really matter if you're aware of this concept of ergodicity, but sometimes that's not the case at all. Uh, and then you have a situation where the ensemble average goes up, for example, and the time average goes down. And now it's super important to realize, am I taking a time average or am I taking an ensemble average? That's one of the annoying things that people don't respect about mathematics. Mathematics does whatever mathematics fucking wants. It's up to you to make sure that what you're doing is allowed, you know, it, because you can make up the axioms. Like there's, there's no police, no one is coming to get you, but like you need to be aware of whether or not it's a right to use it in a given situation. And this is exactly the mistake that YC makes, in my opinion, or maybe they don't make this mistake, but at least they are not doing a good job of communicating it, which is that they are playing an ensemble game. So they have like, you know, a thousand founders and only three people need to be like an Airbnb, a Stripe yep. and a Dropbox and you're Gucci. Yep. But they don't communicate that. So not clearly enough, like uh, every once in a while, it's like Jason Calacanis, like he, he, he will say like, yeah, PC is like, you know, it's rocket fuel, et cetera. But it's like one tweet in like a billion you know, yep. so people don't, you don't communicate that. So you have this situation where you have like a thousand founders, you push everyone off a cliff. And if one person flies, you're Gucci. Yep. But, the prob but the problem is for you, it doesn't matter who that person is. It doesn't matter because you have uh, equity in all of them. Yep. But it does to me because I'm being pushed off the cliff. So my <laughs> problem is a completely different problem. My problem is how can I maximize the probability of my own success which is yep. the, the, the raison d'etre of all of the work that I'm doing with uh, young and research, essentially. How do you maximize the probability of success? I don't give a shit if, 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 if it's like, you know, mind boggling success. In, if anything, that, re well, that drastically reduces the it, probability. So it's, it's a totally it different way. problem. Think about it this way, all right? Like uh, when you're a small company, you're focused on the, your individual customer because you may only have one, right? Yeah. And so I'm building a product for you, not in like an aggregate, okay? Yeah. So like yeah. you give me feedback, I make a change. You give me more feedback, I make a change. I get two customers, they give me feedback. I'm like building for the individual customer, right? Yeah. Bigger your company gets, you lose, good companies keep it, bad companies lose it. You start managing in the aggregate, right? For example, yeah. like, you know, in, if, if we were to focus at Bellhop on, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
our end of, if we were to focus, like, let's say like damage rate is a metric that, that we manage, which it is. Okay. And let's say our damage rate is like 5% of moves have some sort of damage. Right. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to reduce that metric over time. Right. We are taking, we're basically trying to spreadsheet the problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Of like, how do we take this one metric and reduce it by 10% this month? Right. And, but to the customer, our individual customers don't know if we have a 5% damage rate or a 10% damage rate, right? Because they're not using, like for us in particular, they're not using us every single day, right? They could use yeah. us, they could literally use us for nine, 100 yeah. years or 95 yeah. years before they would actually feel that difference, right? And so my, our, my thing that I continually try to remind our, our company is like one of the, these horses that I beat on our board is like, we have to be building for the individual customer, not mm. focusing on the aggregate. Like how do wow. we improve the- So good. Yes, that's such a good point. Do you know Rory Sutherland? No. Oh, um, yeah, all right. Uh, he's the, the, the uh, vice chairman of Ogilvy and Mather. I don't know if Ogilvy is like a huge advertising firm uh, and he runs, uh, he runs the UK. He's like a mentor of mine and- um, he has done a lot of important work in like uh, getting behavioral economics into the mainstream. And, and this is one of the, the, the ideas which you see in behavioral economics, which is also, it's also born out of this ergodicity concept, which is like, there's a difference between one times seven and seven times one, you know, uh, one times, you know, an aggregate or like a bunch of someone doing a given behavior, like uh, multiple times, like once you, once you multiply it, like you lose the differences. So that so a bit of information gets destroyed there. Uh, but but it's a completely different thing, and that's that's what you're alluding to essentially. Where it's like you know, if you if you take the average, then you know you have just you have the average, and it seems fine. But really, that's not what's going on. You know, you need to think about the individuals, and, and it's a and, and completely if different situation. Only, if if time is your most important thing in a startup, right? Think about it like shifting gears in a car. Like you start in first gear, yeah. you wind out first gear, right? Like your first product you like optimize until your RPMs are redlined and like, you're not going any faster. Like it's a good analogy. You keep that engine redlined and like, you're going to be going 15 miles an hour or you shift gears and you start, gl- you know, and that, it, it, so that's how a company is really built is like, you like wind out these gears where it's like, okay, I've got bit, huge diminishing returns on like optimizing this one asymptote. Right. Yeah. Like, how do we create a new app asymptote and shift into the next gear? And a lot of times it's like rebuilding your product or, or building a new product that like categorically eliminates a problem. It's like, you can't optimize your way to greatness. You have to have step change improvements, which are those like gear shifts where you start back at a thousand RPM and you have to slowly get through the power band on that thing before facing that, you know, and the, the, the decision that you have to make to go back to what I was saying earlier is like when you're faced with those forks in a road, which at the time are really difficult decisions. Like, do we keep winding out this gear? I mean, we're hauling ass, right? Yeah. Or do we make the tough decision to shift gears? And I don't know what fourth gear is going to look like. And we're going to start back down at the bottom. But like, I know, you know, we're getting close to winding out this gear. Like if you get to the point where you're trying to manage a single digit metric by one or 2% month over month, your business better be a trillion dollar company, right? Hmm. Or, or you're wasting your time on the wrong things. When you really- Oh, that's should... fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it presented twice, like what is something that you're more comfortable with? Obviously that's like super rough and it depends, yada, 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 but like, you know. I, I think like gear shifts need to happen when you, when you get, when, you need to start thinking about like those, okay, what, what new product do I need to build to, to start optimizing a new on? It's like when you feel like you're like 80% through the gear, you know what I mean? And then yeah. you start thinking about it and you don't want to wait to hundred percent. You, you want to shift in like the power band. Right. Yeah. And so uh, like a lot of MBAs fall into this issue of like, they, they optimization. Get to, yeah. Yes. And like, yeah you can't build a big company through optimization. You have to continue. You have to, you have to shift gears, optimize, optimize, and then shift gears again and start back at the bottom, optimizing this new thing that's, that's taking you faster. 
Yeah, that's a very interesting way of putting it. I've never heard that before. It's a um, yeah, it's, it's a good way of thinking about it. Um, the the companies which are which mostly have like a single product, um, you know, so like the five hour energies or the WD forties and stuff like that. Like those are uh, exceptions, or do they operate on uh, under a different set of axioms? Uh, in your opinion, are you talking about like just a just a totally mature what? product? Exactly. Yeah. Where it's like one product and you have like, you know, uh, pretty much uh, all of the market, like 70% market share or whatever. Yeah. Right. I mean, what, what, once you get to that point and the things just printing cash, like, you know, obviously you, you, at some point your shareholders are just happy with a mature stock. That's going to give a, you know, five or 6% dividend. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and like, you don't have to be that next innovative company because you're a massively profitable multi-billion dollar business or brand yeah it also depends uh on which quadrant of of uh lonzola and strawers um those two uh, professors they they they, they uh, published a paper in harvard business review in uh, 2005 on so um, um first mover advantage and when when does it matter what are the uh, you know what are the criteria etc when you should uh take advantage of it uh, all of that good stuff and in it, in that in that particular paper, they talked about like this 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 matrix, uh, two by two matrix with the pace of technological evolution on one, um, not an axis, but like on uh, the vertical, and the pace of uh, market evolution on the horizontal. Um, you might have seen it, um, but it's 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 the same idea. And if you have something like you know uh, a WD forty, then essentially there you're in a quadrant where pace of market evolution is low, pace of technical uh, technical evolution is also low. So it's it's calm waters. And in such a situation, yep. you're mainly talking about what I always uh, refer to as psychological economic value creation. It's a game of creating value through psychology more so than you know through your sick innovation. <laughs> so yeah. once you have like a, a foothold in the market, yeah, it makes sense that it's more. Um, your your initial dominance position can remain stable for and a longer that, period of time it's like you know when, when you get older you stop wanting to take risks with your investments because you just you're happy mm -hmm. with what you've got and you just want to yeah. preserve it rather, rather than you know take a risk and risk losing it uh and like shareholders drive that so like you know wd-40 uh i don't know who owns that but like let's say it's like procter and gamble or something you know mm -hmm. investors in procter and gamble they are investing in procter and gamble because Procter & Gamble is not taking these big risks. They're Risky. just a company yeah. that is a safe investment. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, t uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, what you're doing right now because, uh, yeah, that's uh, super interesting. Yeah. So, well, so our, our thing is kind of back, go back to what I was saying earlier. Is we think the future is like these early YC types of environments that just feel like a hacker house. Um, yeah. But it's like a power team of really high-level founders and really high level, you know, exited founders or former operators that are like all in this one place together. And, and so we're building what we, is, we think it's the first one that's ever built. It's called Brickyard. I'm based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and, you know, our ethos with Brickyard is what really matters for a pre-seed company or founder to find product market fit is just inputs. It's like, the way that you find product market fit is through, through, is, is through hard work, period. It's laying brick. It's like hours in, you know, yeah. it's a time in your company where one input equals one output. You haven't reached scale. You haven't reached efficiency. Like you are literally just building the foundation of this thing. Yeah. And in order to find product market fit, you just have to be focused. And so we're building out like, a hacker house on steroids. We bought this amazing old hundred year old uh, warehouse that we're <laughs> renovating into. It's kind of like a founder monastery. It's like 12,000 feet of- <laughs> Like the Shaolin temple in, uh, it in is. two years. <laughs> you have to buy it's a like, ticket and- <laughs> It is. It's, it's like, we've got an amazing designer that's building this out. So, but 10,000 feet is like just shared space for all of our portfolio teams. And these are all pre-seed companies. So it's like a founder, two founders, um, one or two employees, like small teams. And it's a jail with no bars. It's just like, it's like a, it's, it, it's, it's a jail run by the inmates. There's no rules. There's no programming. There's no like March towards demo day. It's just our job as partners is to go out and find the best founders, you know, all over the world and bring them uh, into the fold. And if we write a check, 
uh, into one of our, our teams, that team actually moves in to, to f- search for product market fit in our training camp, you know, Brickyard. And so it's like 10,000 feet of space. And then there's uh, uh, two or 3,000 feet is um, we we put in a, uh, we're putting in a a CrossFit gym, a lounge, guys and girls locker room, a co-ed sauna, cold plunges, uh, a couple other things. It's like a place where you can work, you can work out, you can get your mind off things, you can clean up and get back to work. Dude, Um, that's so cool, man. Wow. That's so legit. It's, 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 um, it's, it's, similar but it's a little bit different to what i'm doing obviously you guys have much more resources <laughs> and you've got hair i know so that's not a difference <laughs> no but um yeah what i'm essentially trying to trying to build is one of the things that 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 frustrates the living hell out of me is why is it possible to learn something as compli- complicated as fighting you know fighting is super complex but if you want to learn how to fight get your ass to an mma gym doesn't matter where you live which country why does that not exist for entrepreneurship? If I want to be a doctor, go, go to uh, you know, study medicine. If you want to be a lawyer, you know, the law is very complicated, uh, yep. very similar problems to entrepreneurship in a sense that they don't, that they can't give you like a, like a step one, step two. So you learn stuff around um, uh, how the law works, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to entrepreneurship, suddenly it's like, yeah, well, we can't teach you anything. You have to find it out yourself. You know, that makes no sense. And, yep. and, and, the, and my favorite part is if I spent like, 15 years figuring out like every single thing that I need to know by the time I'm able to separate um, the, the, the stuff that's bullshit from the stuff that's actually true. I, I, I don't, I, I no longer need that skill because now I already have acquired it. So you need that skill when you're like starting out and then someone else starts like a new founder and he has to go through that same process because why? Yep. So wouldn't it be better if like, you know, it's, it's like in medicine and you have like people who uh, are aware of like the previous hundreds of years of, you know, knowledge, and then they teach it to a class of people. And it's like, hey, this is what we've learned over the past years. Now, some of this stuff might change. And m- maybe uh, in 10 years from now, we, we will have like new information. That's fine. But like using a Bayesian, a Bayesian reasoning fashion, where it's like probability based, based on the current level of knowledge, this is the best advice we have. But no, everyone has to read the same books, the same YouTube. Everyone has to learn how to do research, which is the dumbest thing ever because it's super complicated. It's not like you, you just, you know, it's a, it's a field in and of itself, like learning how to separate. I've been doing that for marketing for like a good 10 years, probably more and obsessively. Like a, I, I'm talking a sick number of hours, Cam. And I'm and still some some days I still I'm uh, my students ask me something and I still feel like I don't know anything because it's so hard. Even yeah. in the literature, like half of the, the the professors say X. I read a paper the other day. It's a paper which is uh, it, it, it was about um, marketing measures. And in that paper, it had two pages where the author was essentially like me was like, oh, dude, I'm so pissed off that we don't have a shared lexicon. <laughs> What's going on? Like, shouldn't we define these terms? What do we mean, brand salience? Like yep. this guy says brand salience, he means X. This guy says brand salience, he means the inverse of X. Might that be a situation? Might that be a problem? So yep. frustrating. So it essentially, is. yeah, it so is. essentially long, long, long story short, like one sentence. So what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to build that MMA gym, but for entrepreneurship. So right now we have a cohort going, which is like a 12 week condensed process um, where I share like a lot of the, the, the stuff that I've picked up over the years, like consumer psychology, behavior science, like uh, uh, the, 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 the 20% that gives you like the 80% of the, the bang for your buck, essentially. That is so. So is it a is, so are, are, are all of these uh, companies local or where, where are you finding these companies? Twitter, uh, about half of the co it's a small cohort. It's like eight people. So it's, it's, it's tiny, uh, but everything is bootstrapped. So it's, it's Gucci for me. My burn and is it, fucking is everybody there. coming to one area or is it a virtual thing? Virtual. Yeah. Yep. Virtual. Yeah. Is yeah. We are. Yeah. Everywhere? Yeah, Very exactly. Cool. Every, yeah. Everywhere. Um, uh, so, uh, a few guys in Europe, a few guys in uh, Canada, U S, uh, you know, middle yeah. East, like everywhere. Uh, and essentially, it's like, you see, I'm in my office right now, which is a, a, a ghetto apartment, which I use as my office <laughs> because it's cheaper than an office here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After, there's a glass board and I use that for my lectures. And then we have a lecture and then we have a, a, a homework session, essentially, because the, the key differentiator is when you go to an MMA gym, you, do, you don't have a teacher who's like just talking for two hours. 
He yep. gives you a little, he's like, he's like, yo, Cam, if you want to do a rear naked choke, then make sure that you do it like this and make sure that you grab the head like that, etc. And now get your ass in there and go practice. Uh, yeah. So that's what we do. It's like, because that everyone who- That is really who, cool. Yeah. Everyone who talks about entrepreneurial education talks about entrepreneurial education, even YC, where it's like, you know, a, 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 go try it and here's a lecture, et cetera. But it's, it's in the application. And because yep. of my behavior science background, one of the things that behavior science has really taught me is if, if you have a problem with a subject who really wants something, what everyone does is they blame the subject and specifically the subject's motivation. So you want to lose weight, you come to me, I'm a nutritional expert, what have you, maybe even a professor. So I have a lot of information about like how the body works, et cetera. I say, Ken, this is what you need to do. And I know this because I have expertise on nutrition and uh, I've been a professor for this many years at, at, at prestigious university. So you trust me. So the knowledge components is there. So yeah. then I tell you that and then you don't execute it. Now, now what happens? I, I, I'll tell you what happens. 100% of the time, people will blame you. He's, well, that Cam isn't motivated. Uh, I told him exactly what to do. If he just did it, dude, Cam is a human being. He's not a robot. So yep. the problem is not Cam. The problem is you and your shitty behavior design. So what you need to do is say, okay, Cam, clearly I messed up. So let's change the behavior design. Let's try something else. Because maybe what I, I needed to increase your caloric expenditure and I sent you to the gym. Turns out you hate the gym, but you love to row. So maybe we should try that. And you, you change and you tweak and, and eventually you find a behavior design which worked, uh, works with the subject. And it's the same for entrepreneurship. I can teach, I, I thought I, I uh, was um, teaching pricing architectures, how you can nudge a consumer towards a given price point depending on uh, the architecture of your pricing. So if you have if you have like a price, if you have a, a suite of products and you have a pricing curves, which looks um, kind of like a linear function with like uh, three, uh, three options, or like an exponential function like this, like the, the bottom one, um, or, or something which, which where everything is quite close to each other. So something like this. Yep. And um, by the way, like, like usually you talk about it in, in, in terms of like the, the total value for the consumer. So you're, you're doing a transformation. So you guys with Bellhop, um, you can you can put it you can quantify it like this is uh, worth this much money in terms of the physical cost of not having to rent a car not having to do it yourself uh, but also opportunity cost you don't have to skip a day of work and also like mental component like the stress etc and then you can quantify that so like you 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 price your products in terms of that that the value of that transformation essentially but then how you sequence those pricing creates uh, a different pricing architecture and if you put them like very close to uh, uh, close to each other it'll have a different effect on the consumer with respect to which price point and which product they'll they'll pick and we were talking about that and everyone is like yeah 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 cool 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 but like use it in your company because otherwise yep. what are we doing here well th that and that, that is something that people don't don't acknowledge and and realize do you think that how much of this i think about just the concept of consistency a lot hmm. it's like you know there are a lot of teachers out there that want to teach the way that they know right yeah but it's like i know this way and i'm going to teach you this way but that to your point like the student may not be you know the student may have a totally different style like for example you're like hey we're going to do olympic lifts all right and and the, the, they get in the gym they're like i don't like this at all and then and then yeah. you blame them for not you know being a hard worker or whatever when if you just showed them the rowing machine and they would have fallen in love with it and now they're going to get in super great shape but they're not going to be like a beefy olympic lifter they're going to be like a lean you know it's you know what i'm saying so it's yeah. like how do you find the ability to provide consistency in somebody's life because if you think about like company leaders like ceos for example there are super successful micromanaging CEOs, and then there are super successful CEOs that are like super trust imparting CEOs. There are extroverts, there are introverts. There are like there there are there are successful people across the spectrum in every category, and it yeah. just comes down to consistency. Like, did you take the one thing that made sense in your head, and then you did you do that over and over and over again? Yeah. And that's how most, you know, real success is. And I think what you're, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying is, is like a professor that's trying to change user behavior, so to speak, with all of its, his subjects of like, hey, do it this way. Yeah. That is like ramming your head against the wall because 
you're not speaking the language. You might as well be speaking a different language to these people. And really you should be like, okay, what are you good at? What interests you? Let's find that one thing. And then that's like, put you down that path so you can be yeah. consistent on it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. D don't even ask them because it, 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 it's a crass example. But if you, if you ask guys, like, do you have a, uh, have you ever had a one night stand? Like 100% yes. And if you ask women, like 100% no. So we know it happens. So something is off here. So, you know, consumer psychology teaches you like, don't ask people, you know, actions, 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 watch behavior. Yep. And in this specific situation, you have a professor who's writing code on a computer. The computer is the human, the code is behavior design and the code isn't compiling. Mm -hmm. Are you going to like yell at the computer and be frustrated at the computer? Computer don't care. Computer don't care, Kim. <laughs> so what so, you do, yeah, that's so. You change, you, yeah, you would change the code. You would change I the feel code. Like Maybe you're, you're using like a the wrong much language. more intellectual me. <laughs> we have a lot of the same thoughts, but I can't. I can't articulate them like. You. <laughs> well, you know, you build a, like a mega successful company with like venture, so you know, I think I think you win. <laughs> No, I, it's fascinating. I, I love, I'll, this is a great combo. <laughs> but yeah, essentially what, essentially what you want to do is, um, okay, yesterday I wrote a, I wrote a tweet, um, which I stole from, uh, from a friend who, who, who talks about nutritional science. Um, and in that field, one of the most important things that, that they have learned essentially is, is um, very similar to, to a saying that you sometimes hear people say in like the camera world, which is like the best camera is the one that you have on you. And what they mean by that is like, if you, if you always bring your iPhone and you can use your iPhone to take a camera, but if you have like this super sophisticated camera, but it's a hassle to bring it with you, then you're never going to be, you're never going to be able to use it when you need yep. it. Um, and, and um in nutrition, what, what they found is that the, the biggest determining factor of success is super like obvious, but it's always like within entrepreneurial science, marketing science, everything feels obvious in, in, in hindsight once you know the right answer, but it's adherence. People don't, people don't adhere to diets. So I wrote a tweet um, and it was in a context of behavior design, but if you take it in a context of diets uh, and dietary habits, nutrition, what is the perfect diet? If you, if you make the mistake of treating people like robots, you would say the perfect diet is the, the one that is perfect from um, a physics perspective in terms of like, you know, do you know what I mean? Like this much protein, this, but, yeah. but actually, actually the perfect diet is, is, is the one that's suboptimal because the suboptimal one, it might not be like optimal from a rational perspective, but if a subject can adhere to it, so yep. you throw a little bit of Ben and Jerry's in there. You throw a little bit of pizza in there. Um, you do some things which seem suboptimal, but they are actually optimal because it allows the person to uh, adhere to that uh, diet over like 10 years. So yep. all of the hacks and all of the gimmicks, um, they don't work because they are not sustainable. And the same thing is true in entrepreneurship. So when we're like glorifying, you know, unsustainable habits in entrepreneurship, like, okay, obviously sometimes you need to have sprints. Okay, um, that's true. But like uh, stuff that's 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 um, unsustainable for a very long period of time, like working like uh, eighteen hours, uh, eighteen hour days. You know, that's not a good strategy because it, you, it, you can't sustain it. What's really interesting to me in in, in like human behavior is, uh, I don't know if you follow the Enneagram. Have you ever heard of it? No. Okay, you should look into it. It's fa absolutely fascinating. What's it um, called? It's called the Enneagram, E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M. Um, and it basically categorizes people into nine different types, nine core types. So it's like sort of like a Myers-Briggs thing, but it's like infinitely more actionable. Uh, mm. and, and it's super old. It was developed by like monks like 2,500 years ago. And it's basically st stood the test of time. It's really fascinating. But anyway, one of the things to your point in human behavior is like, fives are the like scientist types right and like one of their basic desires is like is like purity in whatever they do and so that's why a lot of engineers and scientists like over index on like the purity of code or the purity of process or the you yeah. know um and and outside of like the field of science like let's say like there's a there's a type five who's like a, a basketball player okay and they obsess over the mechanics of shooting a basketball and like their form and running and like their form and passing and dribbling and all of those things 
Yeah. Really what they should care about is how many baskets they score or, or pat, you know, assists they make or, or blocks or whatever. Um, they want to score points, but only if it is the product of a perfect process, like, no, you know, a type five doesn't want to, you know, nail a, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a buzzer beating three, if it was like on his, you know, if it was like an underhanded throw, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's like, they want to, they want to, they, they want to score the basket, but almost more important than scoring the basket is like being perfect up into that, you know, like being perfect on a perfect shot that looks perfect that goes into the basket. That would be like a total win. So like when you, when you actually apply that in real life, like let's say it's a fisherman and a buddy of mine is a type five. We did this, uh, we were on a lake recently on a camping trip and he's like, Hey, we, you, you know, paddle me out and uh, let's get on some fish. And, uh, we, you know, I go out and find this school of fish that, that I knew you know, that I'd seen when we'd come in and he's up on the front of this drift boat with a fly rod and he has the most perfect textbook perfect beautiful cast you'll ever see like the tightest loops just the most perfect form all right and he's throwing this little leech that's like barely weighs anything and these fish are 15 feet down all right and he's casting out to them the fish aren't even seeing the fly which is not even sinking okay yeah and and i'm like hey jenkins give me that give me your the end of your line let me real quick let me throw some some split shot on it which is a weight and he's like no, no no let me just let me just keep going let me just give me a second. And he keeps casting at the school of fish. It's 15 feet down. They're not even seeing his fly, which is only you know sinking three inches. And I'm like, Jenkins, let me throw some split shot on your line. He refuses again. And I was like, whoa, okay, what is happening here? And I watch him cast at this school of fish for 20 minutes. Okay. And it occurred to me, he wanted to catch the fish, but only if it was the in his way, in his way. And if yeah. I had thrown split shot on his line, he wouldn't have these, these perfect tight loops, you know, laying out and falling on the water perfectly. He'd be like hunking weight, you know, and yeah. he would yeah. have caught a fish, but it wouldn't have been uh, part of like what he would define as success in his mind. And so yeah. that's when, you, you know, people can get frustrated with engineers and like over engineering this or that. It's like, you need to rem remind yourself what is the outcome that we're all trying to accomplish here. Oh my God. Yeah. We, we, uh, we, okay. So in um, it's called uh, YRC one, uh, young Ling research cohort one. And in YRC one, we kicked it off with intro to behavior design and then uh, behavior science for a few weeks. And uh, now we're, uh, now we're in applied marketing. Um, but, but during behavior design, one of the things that we, we talked about is exactly this. It's so common. And, and even with myself, because there's this weird thing that happens when you learn more, um, your brain becomes arrogant. So your mind is like, well, you know, those are the rules for like those guys, but I'm with, you know, I know this process, you know, so, so you think you're like above the rules, <laughs> you're never above the rules. But one of the oh. things that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's the example of, of, of not respecting this incremental step change, what you were talking about versus like, you know, investing a million dollars, building the platform, not testing your assumptions, launching it. And then, you know, it's the same thing, same but, um, thing. yeah, but one of the things that happens is, um, there are in behavior design, you, you want to start with a, a goal. We call it outcomes or aspirations for, uh, for more specificity. Um, but, but it's important to realize that once you have an outcome or an aspiration, there are like a billion different behaviors that you can do in order to achieve that outcome or aspiration. And something that oftentimes happens, especially with people who are very disciplined and, you know, um, and quite driven, they forget um, that the outcome or the aspiration is the thing that they were trying to achieve and they accidentally replace it with the behavior. So my brother, he's a great example of that. A few years ago, um, he was struggling with like uh, saying no to candy, say no to candy. <laughs> and he had, he had like a sweet tooth. So I told him like, you know, one of the things that you can do is remove the prompt, uh, something that triggers uh, behavior to occur if behavior, if the motivation is high enough and it's easy enough to do. So I told him like, just simply don't buy the, the candy. So it's not in your home there. Therefore, you know, um, you need to like get it at a, like a gas station. It increases the friction. So it decreases the likelihood that the behavior will, will, will execute. 
and and instead of realizing that his aspiration was uh, or his outcomes uh, i should say in this situation uh, uh, was i i i don't want to eat the candy what he did he was like well no you know i'm disciplined and i should be able to say no and just having it at home and it's like now you're now now you're cha- you're it's a completely different aspiration because now you're talking about like mental toughness but that was not the goal initially so yes. you, so you get in your own way and it's and, and uh, really good at changing the narrative exactly we're really really good at changing the narrative exactly and that's exactly what you were talking about where it's like you know you 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 go there and it's like i want to catch the fish and then you get into this vibe and it isn't working and now the the aspiration changes for the behavior design and it's like i want to i, I want to catch it but only with this throw with and yes the, 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 yeah there wasn't a behavior design initially it was about catching the fish exactly exactly yeah. that is so <laughs> funny yeah i mean you can you can take this far further than i can uh it's something i'm i it's it's just absolutely fascinating when you start thinking and kind of at this depth on like how decisions are made yeah Uh, it it, yeah it, it all comes down to what is the person actually actually deep down not what they're telling you that they're that they want but what are they deep down what what is the metric that they're optimizing for or what is the what is the outcome, outcome or aspiration yeah more? exactly exactly yeah. exactly yeah one of the things that we covered in intro to behavior design were uh, were a set of mindsets that you need to have when it comes to behavior design and it's very similar to the analogy that i that i, I absolutely love i'm obsessed with with co- uh, comedians but not really like for watching them to laugh like you know i watch them and i laugh but it's like especially like meta comedy where you have like comedians talking about comedy nothing fascinates me more because those guys are so similar to my type of entrepreneurship and one of the things jerry seinfeld has he has a lot of uh, material on uh, on the internet where he talks about like comedy and how he does it and um, approaches that stuff and one of the things that he talked about is uh, how it's impossible to uh, write a set a set is like your entire uh, set like an hour or, or whatever uh, of material before you ever go on stage and test it and the same thing is true with entrepreneurship. You know, you can't like do it in isolation. So he talks about like this, this attitude of like, you know, you have an idea and then you go on stage and you test it and you get real world feedback. And it, when it comes to entrepreneurship, it's the same thing. You know, you have this idea, you, you um, show it to the, you, you put it out into the world, see if you can sell it, get a few customers instead well, of like doing the opposite of. Uh, that's why I think, you know, a lot of like really high IQ types, uh, they Struggle. get into analysis paralysis on things right yeah. Yeah, and it's like point. it's like the you know it's if, if if you've waited you know if you've waited for a perfect product to ship you've waited you know way too long you know that's yeah. it's that it's that phrase yeah uh, this- uh, what's his name um i can uh naval naval Rafikan. Uh-huh. He, he says something like um um like that 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 perfectionism attitude is like uh it, it's lindy which is a nasim taleb term which is uh like the the the, the period before a situation uh, is correlated to the period after the situation and he said something about not shipping like if you if you haven't shipped for a year then you're not going to ship for another year and yep. i think it's so true like if you haven't shipped for like five years you're you know nothing is going to happen you're going to remain stuck and you're going to repeat that for another five years Totally. And, and by the time you ship, you may ship something that like totally doesn't identify with your customers. Yeah. And I also feel like that that intellectualism and, and thinking out everything, it, do, it, it doesn't even help you. It's the same thing with like comedy. You need to sit down, write a bit, and then you go on stage and you test it. And mm-hmm. that bit doesn't become better if you spend like an additional um, 20 days, 40 days, two years so it's just it's 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 just wasting time. One of the yep. things that really that really annoys me, um, a lot of engineers follow me, and a certain type of engineers, engineers who respect um, uh, uh, marketing, but like real honest to god marketing, not like the the idiots who talk on Twitter uh, and think they they know marketing. Um, but there are essentially two ways in order to achieve an outcome when you're dealing with human beings, when you're dealing with um, robots, the only thing that you can do is like technological economic value creation. You make the thing better by making the thing better. But when you're dealing with people, you also have this angle of psychological economic value, uh, uh, creation, value creation, which is you make the thing better by changing the perception. 
Maybe yep. you change the perception of the problem or what have you. And that's also, that's an avenue of, of, of uh, changing it. And oftentimes um, engineers have this, this uh, obsession of, of only allowing a problem. It's the same what we, what we, were, ju- what we were just talking about with the, the switching of the behavior design and the aspiration. Um, they have this obsession of creating, uh, solving a problem, but it, it must be solved through technological means. It cannot be solved uh, through psychological means. And then you run into situations as well because your consumer doesn't care, you know? He just wants a problem solved. Like, I, I don't care. Who gives a crap if it's like, you know, better tech, whatever. I just have a job to be done, uh, Professor Christensen's uh, uh, framework. And I need it. I, I, it needs to get done. And how you do it, I don't care. <laughs> yep. Totally. Totally. <laughs> All right. Cool, cool, cool. Fascinating. All right. Um, so... Let me let me let me um, ask you one more thing. Um, you you guys are writing checks, uh, C checks, right? In yes. um, in founders, and and yeah. how does that process how does that process work? Well, so I mean, we're talking to we we have a team from from Malta, Italy, uh, coming in. Uh, what is today? Tuesday? Yeah, tomorrow. I mean, we, we are, we're looking for founders all over the world. Uh, I'd say the, the majority of them are in the states that are just like inbounding. Um, but we're talking to, to founders all over the world. Um, and we're essentially just building, you know, what we consider the highest quality, you know, group of founding teams that we possibly can. And, that, you know, that's our investor component. But we're really like at this stage and precede, like you're just betting on people, right? Yeah. And so we need to be, we are... Uh, we, we need to be excited about the, the concept, but we know like every one of these concepts is going to change 20 times in the next, you know, 12 months. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. really it's a bet on people. And so, um, yeah, we're backing pre-seed founders all over. You know, we have no terms or like mandates on like how long our teams have to stay at Brickyard. It's like, you know, if you, if you take a check from us, and, you know, you move to Chattanooga and you, re- you realize three months later that your customers are all in Chicago and you need to be there. Like our teams will, will absolutely do that. Our job is just to build the best possible place for early stage founders to, to build and find product market fit. And if, if, if we lose one of our teams, if our teams come here and just says, you know, look, we need to be somewhere else. That's like our failure, because mm-hmm. our view is. The, the, the number one factor that kills most companies in the early days is lack of focus and being distracted. Yeah. And it's not using your time wisely. Like I kind of was saying earlier, one input is one output in the early days. So the best thing you can do is, and this may sound like hustle porn, but like in my mind, it's just, it's just a truth. Like in the early days, you just have to put the work in uh, yeah. before you found any of these like, you know, scalable products. And, uh, and so we're I, like generally identifying with founders who want to, who are kind of like the contrarian types that know, like trying to build a company in Miami is probably not the best place to find product market fit because, you know, you too much got, distraction. Exactly. It's like, yeah. it, it, would you want to be building your company? That's, you know, an airplane that's running out of runway at an impeccable pace like, would you want to try to build that airplane on spring break when all your friends are around you, like wanting to go out to the bars and, you know, what yeah. I'm saying? like, no. Yeah, yeah. So we're basically building a place for founders that want to intentionally exit the rat race in order to just put all their effort into a singular thing yeah. and burn the ships is our kind of our mantra. And so when we find founders, like we don't make sense for everybody, like period. I mean, like there are teams that need to build in like a high hype environment, you know, where, you know, publicity yeah. really matters. <clears throat> Our camp is just focused on like the founders that, you know, are building those, those, you know, 10 year overnight success stories where they're just putting their head down and grinding. Right. And, uh, and, and call us old guard, but like, you know, that's, that's just our view on, on how great companies are built. It's, it's, the, the vast majority are just founders that are fully focused and, and aren't distracted. Cause like when you raise around, you're going big, everybody wants to piece of you. Politicians want to talk to you. Journalists want to talk to you. Other founders want to pick your brain. Investors are constantly want to keep up with what you're doing. Like everyone in your life comes out of the woodwork and is like wanting to pull at you because you're taking a risk that they're not, or you're doing something yeah. that's interesting. And the risk is 
that feels like work to go and talk oh, about your company. Such a good point. Such a good point. Yeah, such it's a good not, point. It's not at yeah. all. Like it, yeah. it, it is it, the, the only thing that matters for you finding product market fit is putting your head down and building. And so to the extent that we can remove those distractions from all of our founders and put them in an environment where they are around super ambitious, hard charging people, they're around people who've been through it before, they've got the right capital, uh, you're just going to be able to move a lot faster in our, in, you know, yeah. and this is just our belief. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. There are, there are uh, three um, components or three levers um, that, that, that uh, I don't want to say three levers that you can pull. There are like three categories of, of uh, macro level behavior change. One is like a, an epiphany. So you get a heart attack and it inspires you to drastically permanently change your nutrition habits. Uh, the second one is environment, which is what you guys are doing. And the third one is what uh, what we have been focused on in uh, the behavior design or the behavior science lectures, which is like um, how can you uh, have a systematic approach to behavior designing, essentially like scaling the behavior back, making it easier to do, such that uh, you don't need as much motivation, trying different behaviors in order to achieve an outcome and an aspiration. The last one is is the is is um, uh, it's, it's a good skill to practice, but like environment, if it's possible, uh, it's really powerful. Th that's one of the reasons why, you know, when you have an actor or an actress and they need to lose weight, they, they use the environment component. They hire the personal chef, they hire the personal trainer, they hire the personal everything. Someone who slaps food out of their mouth when they're trying to <laughs> take a bite of the Twix. It's like, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it, so yeah, that makes it easier. Are you guys handling the education component as well? We're, or, we are, we are, you know, we provide that, but on a, like, on, not on, in like a, like an active way. Like we don't okay. have, you know, we don't show up and say, hey, Wednesday, everybody show up for this talk that we're doing on this or that. Got it. Um, yeah. We're, we're really, basically we are just in the building and like when a team wants to, you know, do a mock board meeting with us or when a team wants to, you know, riff on, on, you know, a fundraising deck that they're putting together or if they, you know, have like small questions about this or that, it's like the problem, one of the problems we're solving is a lot of, you know, founders that raise money from a bunch of investors that are distributed everywhere, a lot of whom like you have never met personally, you know, and there's no real like trust or connection there. When you have a question that you don't have the answer to, you're not going to send an email to all your investors and be like, hey, should we incorporate in Delaware or Texas, right? Because that would be a negative negative signal that you yeah. just sent out. Delaware, you know? <laughs> exactly. And <laughs> and and so it's like it's like just being adjacent to these founders and and building that level of trust. We're like we know how hard they're working, right? So they can come. They know we know how hard they're working, so they can come and ask a stupid question. Yeah, uh, that's so. Yeah, that's yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, going back to the MMA analogy, like you know, uh, when it comes to like MMA, you can ask like all of the dumb questions because like everyone realizes that at some point, like no one knew. Um, but yeah. but this is uh, yeah, entrepreneurs, especially in in your neck of the woods, where it's like high growth startups, essentially, you, uh, it's it's almost like there's an expectation that you have it all figured out on like day one. It's like weird, super weird. Because how, how, how would you even, you know? No, but, but yeah, it's this weird, like ego sort of thing, like this machismo, or maybe that's not the word, but it's like, it's like no one in start, like startups is a game of failures, right? But no one wants to talk about that. They just want to talk about the good things that, that happen. Like every time you see a, Hey, this company raised 200 million, you know, from, from, you know, the vision fund or something uh everybody's just like oh my god that's amazing like no one realizes like the 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 mania that led up to the closing of that round right and mm. how many back and forth and how many times the founders thought the whole deal was going to die and like how many times like you know you you were you're playing two investors on each other and you took a risk to say th this or that yeah. and like you didn't know how yeah. it was going to pan out i mean like that's an eternity of like pain and suffering to lead up to one of those, just one of those positive outcomes. And like, I respect the, the pain far more than like the, the headline of like, we did this or that. And oh, I, I think, I do think that so we're, 
we're in like a moment of like vulnerability where vulnerability is becoming a strength. And that is a good thing because uh, it allows you to just connect with other human beings. It, it used to be like, we're going to be, you know, all prim and proper and I'm going to speak on the news and I'm going to act like I have all the answers. And that's like sort of degrading now to a point where, you know, people um, are getting credibility by just being honest and vulnerable and transparent about like what is actually happening in their life you know yeah yeah that's a good development so obviously um you know a ton about like um how venture venture works essentially um whereas i may i mainly focus on like bootstrapping for uh for the for the probability maximization reason like it's it's uh easier to replicate at, at least uh, i believe in uh, at this moment in time maybe like in 15 years once, once i know more about like how venture works but i've never done it and so and i don't know um, uh, a lot about it but like um it, it, yeah are you Okay, so here's my naive take. My my take essentially is that if it's possible, uh, technical constraints permitting, um, bootstrap your company such that you don't really need the capital and you you find yourself in a position where you know people are trying to like you know convince you to take their capital yep. versus like, okay, so yeah, so you would agree with that? Oh, I, I totally. I mean, people just you you know this is another one of those things like you know I think venture is attracting a lot of people for the wrong reasons right now like people want to go raise a big round of funding because it it is makes you a celebrity looks cool it yeah. looks cool right but like the pain that comes from a company that takes venture that doesn't actually need to take venture is immense and it, mm. it's it's based on like founders need to understand like are you building a a a a, a bmw or are you building starship right okay if you're building a bmw you you, you yeah. can if you put rocket fuel in a bmw the engine's going to explode right yeah. it, and it's like it's not that it, building a bmw is bad and building a starship is good it's just two it's different, different. yeah like if you bootstrap a company and you don't take any money and you get that thing to, to, you know, 10 million in ARR and you sell the business for a hundred or $200 million and you own a hundred percent of it. Right. That is every bit as good as going and raising 200 or $300 million, owning 10% of the company. And, you know, at, when it's all said and done and exiting at a $2 billion valuation, right? Like the outcome to the founder is the same, except the, the latter was a fuck ton more stressful then <laughs> right and yeah. so uh, yeah it's like people should not have shame about like it, you know i just think the wrong messaging is being put out there that like you have to raise venture it's like no what you again it's like what do you want do you want to make money or do you want to have like status right yeah there are a lot of yeah. people that like say they want to make money but really they just want to you know the status of raising a bunch of money and having a venture back business and it's the same thing as my buddy throwing a fly rod um yeah. and you just have to have the honesty you know you have to ask the question up front what am i trying to do do we need venture to build this thing or or do we not yeah, that's such a great point. And also, if you if if you are um, able to bootstrap it, um, obviously you you give yourself a period of time where you can test your assumptions, uh, which is good because maybe you know you you you'll realize that some of your assumptions were flawed, uh, and then you have more information on whether or not you actually want to raise. Um, yeah, but also one of the things that 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 I that I often think about is. Um, In a lot of situations, especially when the innovation comes from psychology mainly, so there's 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 um, there's you can innovate through uh, technology technology, which is like the the stereotypical uh, uh, hard tech startup. Uh, but like the vast majority of startups are like hard market startups where, where it's the problem is not like, Ooh, uh, we know what people want, but like, Ooh, can we build it? Which is very 1980s uh, type of entrepreneurship, but it's yep. like, you know, we, we can pr build pretty much anything, but like, yep. do people actually want it? Yep. And in, yeah. And in those situations, if you allow yourself to bootstrap, um, you can test a lot of the, these assumptions before you're, you're accepting that rocket fuel. But the main thing that worries me is, is, that, is that the difficulty of knowing the size of the container in those situations. So when you're doing something like SpaceX, 
you, you, if it works out, you, you're pretty sure that the size of the container is big, you know? Yeah. But if, yeah. You're, if you're doing some kind of crazy app, you know, some very simplistic app, you don't know if this is the size of the container or if it's like, you know, just, just this minuscule, uh, this minuscule quadrant here. But now you've accepted VC and you have shareholders and they need returns. So now you're in a situation where I'm almost like a human being where you, you're trying to like tweak the genetics in order to uh, grow a human of, uh, who is like five meters or like 10 feet tall. Um, and, you know, all, all kinds of weird stuff is going to happen. Andrew Mason actually said that in, in, in one of his, so uh, it was a period of time when I was studying his work. And there was one like interview, I believe it's even, it's not even on the internet anymore, but I have it in, in my, uh, in my uh, notes uh, where he says something along the lines of that Groupon was a company which, which, uh, which probably should have never raised uh, cap because it, it, it would have been better um, had they just uh, bootstrapped the, the business for a variety of reasons. And I think there's, there's some truth in it. If you look at like what, what Groupon is uh, right now, it, it, it's something which had like a certain, um, a, a, a certain, Total, uh, total addressable market in a sense. And it's like, yeah. you know, they, they try, they, they blew it up beyond its proportions in order to get everyone a return. Yep. And uh, yeah, one of the things that he talked about was like his um, not being comfortable with uh, sending the, the users um, three, three mil emails a day where it's like, hey, we have this deal and we have this deal and we have this deal, but like you have to because you need to maximize revenue, all of that stuff. So you get into these weird situations where um, that you don't have when you're doing like hard tech, like uh, with SpaceX or uh, Tesla, because the market actually is there. So I think that's also something which people don't really give enough consideration to. And this is exactly something which you can figure out when you're, when you're bootstrapping because you have more time to get a feel for the market and, and actually the market size. Totally. Uh, yeah. I mean, th that is, that's a perfect way of describing the, the decisions that these founders have to make on like, you know, what are you actually trying to do here? Because, you know, if you if you if you like for, for a venture investor a grand slam is like a like a decacorn okay Uber, yeah exactly it used to be unicorn and now it's decacorn yeah decacorn now and like a home run is like a unicorn right and then like singles don't matter doubles don't really matter triples like are helpful yeah. they don't really yeah. you know like the power law in, in venture is i think if you look there's something if you look at every fund that's ever been created like 95 percent, somewhere around 95 percent of the return of that fund was returned by one or two companies in that in that fund right yeah exactly and so yeah. what we're talking about pushing people off a cliff like that's yeah. exactly what's happening it's like but it, i think it probably a, a more apt analogy would be like you have like 100 people that that like you have a bar on their back and, and like you are just marching them forward, okay? And like the venture is pushing them to go faster and faster and faster and faster. And like some of those, those people just aren't gonna be able to keep up with that bar and they're gonna fall over and just get flattened, right? Yeah. At the end of it, you're gonna find, like venture will push until they find those, those, those deck corns, right? Yeah. And, um, and that's, just, putting it. that's just the nature of the beast is, is like, you are putting yourself in a pressure cooker. Um, you're, you're adding in a new variable of, of like uh, accountability and, and like a new power at the table. And, um, you know, and, and it can work out for you, but it's, it's a, it, you have to have a lot of confidence in, in what you're building um, to, 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 you know, to go down that path of like, I want, give me the heat bring bring the pressure on we you know we're not going and building a hundred million dollar business we're going and building a yeah. hundred billion dollar business was that something which was scary for you guys at bellhop was it like, well, like your, your your heart yeah <laughs> night sweats <laughs> well like we we like we're, we we were like a, a frog being boiled you know slowly you know it was like we didn't know all the dynamics at play in venture when we first took our our first round right like we learned what those what those were and uh and so you know i think there's a lot more uh visibility and transparency today on like what is what is like growing a venture-backed business actually like you know people are actually coming out and talking about you know the the uh 
the founder of Whole Foods likened a, a VC on, on a podcast, likened a VC like a hitchhiker who has a gun. As long as you're taking the VC where they want to go, everybody's all happy and, you know, and you're having conversation, you, everybody's having fun and you're just riding along. The second you start taking them somewhere they don't want to go, it's you like really gone. Back, you know? <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yeah. And, and so that is becoming like more widespread knowledge. And I think that's helpful because when you really just, you know, when you reduce it down, like what, as a, as a founder, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to create financial independence for you and your family? Okay. Well, your one metric should be, what is the outcome? What is the financial outcome for me in this situation? Right. Uh, and there's two ways to do that. Bootstrapping it is, is you're not going to have as much resources as you would if you took on venture. Um, but the outcome has to be much smaller, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the, the probability of success is, uh, is, is higher. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. Are you familiar with uh, Shamat's uh, take on um, on venture? I don't know if you've seen. Uh, he was in um, in uh, this week in startups a um, few years ago with Jason, and there's a, a clip of him going viral. Have you ever seen it where he talks about the the, the Ponzi scheme of uh, of Silicon Valley, essentially? I I haven't. I, I I you know he said a lot of things about venture. I don't know if I remember particularly that that one thing, uh, but. The, Essentially, what he said is that, um, you know, Silicon Valley VCs, they make money when, uh, you know, a founder exits, exit event, uh, acquisition, public, what have you. Um, But also uh, by taking a certain percentage of uh, the amount of money that they raised. So uh, what he was describing is a situation where, you know, someone gives a gives a founder a seed round, pushes them to grow faster. Then they raise an A, pushes them and those guys push them to grow faster because they want to return. Then uh, a B pushes them, push them to grow faster, a C. And then by the time someone between uh, B and C or C and D, uh, the guys who did the first round, they go back to their LPs and they're like, look how good we're doing. Look at all these paper returns. And now they can raise a bigger cap, maybe do a second, maybe get into like A rounds essentially, all because they're essentially like optimizing for the percentage of, of uh, uh, assets under management essentially. Yeah. So that was something that he was critiquing. Do you, is that That's, something that you, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think he's spot on with that. I mean, mm-hmm. you really liken it. There are a lot of Ponzi schemes that exist in, in the world today that have just kind of been like justified or overlooked. Um, yeah. But it's, it's an, it's, it's, it's a, it's an effective uh, means of, of scaling anything, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a cheat code. And so if you can, if you can figure out, you know, a structure that can be like justified within society to run one of those things, that's going to be done. And I think a lot of like, you know, a lot of people, for example, you know, high finance really dictates a lot in a, in a, you know, in a capitalistic system, which I'm a, a you know, a, a huge capitalist and believe in, you know, entirely yeah. as, it's not a perfect system, but like, you know, <laughs> it's better than anything else we tried. It's always. Uh... <laughs> yeah, right. And we may be on to something with DAOs, but uh, I'm still trying to figure out what's free. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's like it, it's stock options, for example, that was created, you know, stock options. If, if employees. We, we invented the stock market, by the way. You know what? We invented the stock market. Sure. I'm, yeah. I'm Dutch. I'm Dutch. Oh, you invented, you, yeah. My you country, invented. yeah, exactly. Wow. VOC, the VOC in the uh, 1600s. I don't think I realized that. No, yeah, with the, the trade, the trade of spices, etc. Interesting. Yeah. I'll have yeah, to look yeah, at yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah, like, you know, stock options is, it, it, employees, it, it was created to be this vague thing, right? Where like, yes, you can make money on stock options, but if you're fired or if you leave the company, you're going to have a short window of exercising. When you exercise them, you're going to have, you know, all sorts of tax implications. Uh, You have to come up with the cash. Like there are a lot of hoops that you have to jump through in order to, for that to actually make sense for you. And of course that was created to give these, you know, employers leverage over their, you know, uh, another means of incentive aside from just cash, um, you know, salaries, et cetera. So um, it, it is a, 
you just talk about like how a lot of these things were just created for uh, it, they were designed with something with 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 returns in mind right so if you're a bootstrapping entrepreneur you just need to understand that venture you know is not just this sunshine and rainbows and rocket fuel and this and that like there are big implications that come with it and it's going to completely change the way that you're going to think about your business run your business you know work manage your 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 stress load etc yeah interesting all right um obviously you you're uh, you guys are writing checks um so I, I assume that means that uh, um you're trying to get your uh, your founders um to have a, some sort of exit event uh, right like an acquisition or uh, you know possibly an ipo i don't know if you if you guys are uh, folks yeah i mean yeah i mean so we're yeah we're in we are we are the the you know I talk crap about investors, but we are venture investors. And so we are. Yeah. But there uh, are differences be between like, you know, yeah, how, how you do it, like, yeah, ethically, I think, uh, what have you. I think being, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about being an, a, a former operator as an investor is different, right? Like, I don't mm -hmm. think it necessarily makes, like, just because you're a former operator certainly doesn't make you a better investor. Uh, it's a different style. Uh, and, 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 and also like you also like your knowledge and your empathy comes comes through you know the way you speak and yeah that's what i mean about like style it's like style felt by the by the founder right when you yeah. have a a former operator that's an investor like that relationship is going to just be wildly different than a relationship with you know with just like a somebody that you know, went into consulting, consulting at a college and was an eye banker and, you know, worked their way yeah. into, you know, the business, you know, that way. Um, but, but yeah, so we, we're a venture investor and we're, we're, we're making all of our investments that we make are, you know, are, could this be a, a decacorn, right? Um, yeah. I think our priorities are more like, we're doing this not to make LPs money, like it's totally self-funded. Um, oh, okay. But our, like our main goal is like, how do we put, how do we build the, like this amazing culture and this amazing clan community of founders and, and put them in a situation where they can really enjoy the ride. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the, this, our selfish ambition over like financial returns is we just want to be around these types of people every day. Right. Like yeah, that's what we're enough. doing. So, yeah. yeah. It's unlikely that, uh, I'm going to be able to help you uh, get like the, the Deca coins probably. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's, different, that's, different style of students, but uh, yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 yeah, no, I, I, I uh, and that's, the, the, you don't, you don't need to, to, to get something out of every exchange you have, you know, with, with <laughs> other, with other humans. And I've, I've certainly got plenty out of this. This is amazing. That's cool. That's cool. I, I understand from um, the economics, per, per, yeah, the, the economics point of view, uh, but it would be cool if there were more uh, funds where you didn't have this dynamic where you know uh, uh, 999 people fill and one becomes a decacorn, but where it's like you know a higher probability of success but like a, a lower exit. But yep. I uh, the, the economics make that uh, make that tricky, or you need to figure something but, out with like the check what? size or something. I don't know. I mean, Mailchimp just is a deck mm -hmm. is an exited deck deck of corn at this point, Which and they were completely yeah. bootstrapped, right? Yeah. So I think you know, it's just because you bootstrapped your company does not mean that you don't have the chance of building a gigantic business, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I think your your listeners need to really understand that. I think like the just the question that might be helpful for for your you know for your audience is like, should we? you know, consider venture or not, not based on like, you, you know, should we do it? Cause it's going to be cool. And we're going to, you know, our governor is going to call us and congratulate us on our, you know, round of funding that we raise. Like yeah. it, if you're doing it because it makes sense for your business. Then it probably, you know, then, then it makes sense. Right. You just, like, I think that that's a, a, a big point of failure with founders is like, you have to be intentional on like, do we raise capital or do we not? And like yeah. the outcome should be what is going to be the best outcome for us personally and our teams. Do you see a possibility of building um, what you guys are building, but um, 
for companies who are trying to exit at you know um, ten million dollars, a hundred million dollars, somewhere in that range, or do you totally. think uh, the equity? Okay. I mean, I mean, basically, what we're building is like a you know, this word has been like um, run through the mud, uh, but like it's a fraternity. We're just building a group of like like-minded co-ed individuals that like decide that they want to spend time with each other, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, founders will realize it's not the destination that, that, that matters. It was the journey. And that's like the most cliche term ever, you know, ever made. But it is so true. Our seed investors, uh, Ted Allen and Barry, who are now our partners in Brickyard, uh, they built a bootstrapped a third party logistics company from nothing to they sold it for around 500 million bucks um, in 2013. And, uh, and, and they owned 100% of the company. So their, their personal outcome was giant. And they wanted us, like they had just made an investment in us like a year prior. And- um, Bellhop or Brickyard. In Bellhop. And, uh, and they wanted us to experience like their experience of crossing the finish line with an exit. And I, we literally sat in the room with them when, when they were hitting refresh on their computers and then all of a sudden they just kind of like slumped in their seat and they just stared at their screen. <laughs> and, and, and like, I was like, we're on the other side and we're just like, did it happen? And they were like, yep. That's and, crazy. And I was like, surely this has to be the best day of your life. Like I was looking at these guys that were 10 years ahead of where we had just started our journey with bellhops. Like, and they had just completed the race that we just hoped that we'd be able to, you know, finish in, in a decade. And they'd sat, you know, they all sat there and Barry kind of just passively just sort of like casually looked up and just shook his head and was like, no, it's not the best. Uh, uh, and it was a feeling of I love loss. that. It's a feeling of loss that they had. They just sold mm. something that they had like poured their life into. And yeah all three of them, you know, would tell you they all you struggle with their own, you know, uh, uh, bouts of depression over the next uh, year, because it was, it, it really was. Yeah. And like, it is, it's about the people that you surround yourself with uh, that really matters. And, you know, when you look back on everything, it's not the outcome. It's, it's like, it's, it, it's those moments of, of pure joy and like pure desolation that you experience in building something. Yeah, you lose a little bit of your your purpose. Yep. In in such situation, I think if you can, um, if you're choosing the to go to bootstrap route, um, if you can find find a way, you know that uh, if you can find a way, like you should do that obviously as quickly as possible. But make the business profitable such that you know your your personal burn is low. The business uh, throws off a, a, enough uh, of a compensation to to you as an owner. Uh, such that you you exceed that that uh, that threshold. It's essentially like taking minimalism and applying it to business, and then over time, you know, you can increase that as the business does better with uh, profit and paying yourself more. Um, yep. Then you're exit independent in some sense. You know, if someone wants to acquire your business, you're like, you know, I, I'm already getting paid what I want like every month. So because because for me, uh, and I don't know if that's I, I don't know maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but like money doesn't really motivate me. Like, you know, it's like I, I could have been a comedian in, in, a, in another world and not because like comedy, uh, uh, comedy, but like the, the parallels where it's like I just enjoy the craft. For me, it's yep. about the craft. It's like it just so happens that we're playing entrepreneurship and, and the, the entrepreneurship points are money. But like yep. if you're baseball and you're, you know, you, you have like a, a point like, oh, there, there was a home run, etc. But just our, our points are like special points, which you can like use to pay for stuff. It, it, you've discovered, but for me, it's, it's about the craft. Of, and you have discovered like pure joy and peace. And when you when you understand that that, that is what that that is what life is about. <laughs> it makes it seem like you know, like I'm some like Zen monk. I've it all figured out. I, I don't have I don't have a cohort. I have a cult. No, I'm gonna I, a, a cult one. <laughs> I'll tell you because when you're so like. The, particularly with, with founders that are, they're trying to find product market fit, like in the moment, it's so uncomfortable. Like you're so uncertain. You're not sure if it's going to work out. 
the the like lows are so low you the the highs are so infrequent it's such a hard thing but when you get out of those days you realize that those were the golden days and there was no way for you to actually see that in the moment like yeah. there's a quote from the office i wish we knew we were in the golden days when we were actually in them you know and That's good. when you get out of that that like that pre-product market you know uh uh fit stage. phase stage of your company all you want to do is just get back to the to to that because that's when you felt most alive like it, it's yeah. the weirdest thing yeah we uh, we we talked we, talk, we talked about behavior design um having an aspiration and an outcome and then uh you know trying uh, different behavior designs uh, and, and not being loyal to a, a specific behavior design and being comfortable with uh, testing out different things. I think uh, when it comes to, all right, I think when it comes to um, uh, this, it's the exact same thing. You don't, not having loyalty to um, a specific approach in order to find product market fit, but being very comfortable with like trying a bunch of st uh, different things and being comfortable with that process which is definitely something that, you know, um, it's, it's a skill. It's something that you need to practice because it, it is uncomfortable. Totally. That's yeah. all like our theme is suffering. Like we are building a place where the bunch of people can come together and suffer the gauntlet together. And that it's, it's doesn't make it any easier, but it does. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you uh, two more questions and then uh, let's quickly wrap it up. Um, so you mentioned one internal marketing metric, which you used in, uh, in Bellhop. You were uh, talking about um, uh, breakage was the, was the, the label yeah, damage, that you used? Yep. Damage rate. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually published uh, something about um, internal marketing metrics, external marketing metrics. Like uh, what was the process that you used to, to figure out which metrics uh, you should use at Serta? Was it, was it like a, a little bit of trial and error where it's like, well, we're uh, using these metrics or these ones don't correlate. Uh, let's use these. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of building a business is understanding, becoming to understand the business, right? So you obviously, you have metrics that have big impacts on your P&L, right? And that, it, it, that's like, those are like, almost like, you know, that's a very tactical way of looking at like, what metrics are, matter to us, right? Yeah, sure, short term stuff, essentially. But and that, the stuff that's, that's, that's easily like, quantifiable. Yeah, right. Like basically getting those right and, really, and, and being like, okay, uh, damage rate for us is really, you know, it, it, let's say it's 5% of revenue. Like that's a big percentage, right? So that obviously yeah. needs to be something that we need to, you know, start to, to, to bring Decrease. down, et cetera. Yeah. And, but, but that is basically just like, how do you make the business model work, right? Like those are the metrics that you're going to whittle on to like, just make a thing that like, you put in one dollar and you get two dollars out of the bottom, right? The 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 more complicated piece is like, how do you actually build a great business in the eyes of your customer, right? Yeah. And like yeah. to your point, to our point earlier, like we could optimize damage rate in, until the cows come home, right? Yeah. But if we're not actually building a better experience for the individual customer, like the individual customer isn't going to view us as like, oh my god, bellhop is amazing they have a five percent damage rate like they barely yeah. ever you know damage anything uh yeah. but we may be like totally missing like the pieces that matter most which is like how did they make how did bellhop make me feel when they were in my home right yeah like, that's such a good point such a good, it's so funny that there's so much uh stuff which is comes from the literature um that that you have I don't want to say internalized because you haven't read the literature and then came to this conclusion, but like empirically discovered on your own, essentially, because this is a lot of stuff which uh, hasn't really been talked about, like until maybe the 2000s or something, when we started realizing uh, different ways of thinking about marketing and uh, thinking about these these things which are less tangible you know um a, a very simple example would be do you do you treat uh customer support as a profit center or as a cost center you know yeah. and the, the yeah and and the mba style which is very straightforward very like rational it's just like everything is a cost and let's decrease everything as much as possible which makes sense if you have a business which is non-fungible because then you're in a race like who is the cheapest but but see that what what comes into play there is like the most important thing a founder can have is, is judgment. It's not IQ, it's not mm -hmm. EQ, it's not, 
any, it's not any, it's, it's what decisions are you making when you don't have all the information, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like, you know, the, the best thing a founder can do is, and actually, let me say, you know, earlier on the, on the topic of vision, that's what vision is, is like, what do I want to create? With yeah, this? good point. Yeah. Do I want to create a business that's like just super pr like profitable where our margin is super high? Or do I want to create a business where it's like we put a much bigger emphasis on like the customer experience than the margin piece. And like it's all going to work out because we're going to be a much bigger company if our customers really love us. Right. Yeah. Such a good point. Yeah. Such a good. This is well, this is actually one area where I think that. Um, Obviously, I'm biased, but why I think the work I'm doing is important because there, there actually is a lot of literature on certain uh, questions that entrepreneurs have, and they don't realize that a lot of this stuff already has uh, been studied. So it's kind of like medicine where you can have a gut feel, but it, it's more useful um, to actually look at like um, empirical medicine and see like, okay, they try to approach A, they try to approach B, and the highest probability of success is approach B. Therefore, you know, that's the more rational choice. But if you never look at like the literature and stuff like that, then you're always reinventing the wheel. Um, so that's something which I personally uh, miss a little bit. But but I don't want to open this whole can of worms because it's super interesting. At some point, we're going to have a conversation because this is super interesting talking about like, you know, the, the long term marketing game, essentially, and the short term. Because even in academia, there's a lot of uh, people who agree and disagree and uh, what have you. It's, yep. it's clear where uh, which uh, side of the, the thing I fall on. Um, all right, so one last question, which is something which I think you can answer probably fairly quickly. Um, the last one, which is uh, how important is it to have the, the right credentials when you're, you're raising venture? So the typical is, is like, you know, Ivy League education, Stanford, you know, you did, you did, you, I don't know, you, you uh, did an internship at Google. And uh, when you were done, uh, you went to work for like uh, in a, a successful startup or maybe at A16Z, what have you. I think I may be very like a nobody, this, but I didn't, I didn't have any of that. And mm. I don't think that that, you know, I think that probably played, you know, in, in a lot more heavily, like a decade ago, I think now it's just all it comes down to when you're trying to raise a round of funding is product market fit. It's just, can you get the person on the other side of a table dreaming with you? Right. Mm. That's all it is. It's like, interesting. Can you present something in a way that they did not expect? Right. Mm. And I think credentialing, you know, matters way less, you know, today. It certainly matters way less in like hiring and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think in a lot of ways, it, it, it may end up being a, a almost like sort of like a neutral or a negative signal um, because in a startup, you really want people that aren't just like pattern recognized, you know, match. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. You want someone that is thinking outside the box because that is how, big ideas happen is like is something is thought about you know just in a, in a way that's just slightly different than anybody else has, has had thought about it before so yeah, yeah i mean i i'm definitely not a you know i i i had like a two five gpa at a state school in alabama and you know i just was never interested in school it just never you know yeah it, 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 like I did the bare very minimum. common with entrepreneurs very common I think it's a structure like there's a there's a, a, good, a right answer and a wrong answer and it's more about obedience for it's more about proxies for just like the real thing yep but um all right well uh man I really appreciate you uh this has been an amazing conversation uh if um yeah if people want to get in contact to you uh, with all of the stuff that you're doing uh where should i send them uh, is there like a obviously the website i'll, I'll put it in uh, the description uh yeah. an email maybe you want to give out or what have you yeah yeah i mean you connect with me on linkedin my name's cam duty like howdy duty uh no it, it was tough on me in middle school uh <laughs> our url for brickyard is just laybrick.com just laybrick.com uh, yeah, we've got like a little manifesto on there. I mean, it's, it's a very minimalistic site, but but uh, you can you can contact us um, there as well. But um, yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter. I have like uh, 350 followers. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, you know if you want to add to that, bring it on. <laughs> awesome. duty. But uh, anyway, this has been great. Uh, I really I, I look forward to. Hopefully, we can do it again sometime. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely awesome. And uh, I'll keep you I'll keep you posted on uh, when I upload this. 
Sounds good, buddy. Take it easy. All right. Take it easy. Bye.